Hi, this is the first video in a series of videos on naming and formula writing for compounds. Um, I want to start with this. This is a picture of uh, the box that my toothpaste came in. And you can see it, the active ingredient in this is sodium fluoride, uh, which is NaF. Uh, that's delivering the fluoride ions that keep our teeth strong. Um, and then if you look in the inactive ingredients, we see water, <laughs> which I think we're all familiar with. Uh, you can also see sodium lauryl sulfate, sodium hydroxide, titanium dioxide. These are all things that we know how to write formulas for in chemistry. And if you're looking at the ingredients label of something, after this unit, you might be able to recognize some of the things in some of the products that you're buying. Um, in the chemistry world, this is really important because if you look at just these two uh, examples of substances, at quick glance, they look very different. I mean, the one on the left is yellow. It's kind of clumpier. The one on the right looks like red, orange, sugar, kind of. Well, these are very actually very similar. This is uh, potassium chromate on the left here, and on the right is potassium dichromate. And if you look at their formulas, you can see why they have such similar names. K2CRO4 is the formula for potassium chromate. K2Cr207 is the formula for potassium dichromate. Um, but going to the shelf, if you're doing a lab and grabbing one, meaning to grab the other, certainly a reasonable thing to do if you're just looking at the name. Um, but they are very different substances. And so the names and the formulas of substances matter because even small differences could mean very large differences in properties for substances. So I just want to start with this example of a formula just to kind of clear some things up. You probably already know this, but the element symbols in a formula represent the elements, of course. Uh, but the small numbers that sometimes appear in formulas are called subscripts, and they represent how many atoms of the element that it follows. So for example, in this formula, there are two atoms of potassium, there are four atoms of oxygen, and there's only one atom of chromium, the CR in the center there. Notice we don't write subscripts of one. If we're writing the element symbol and then there's no subscript beyond it, uh, that just implies that there's only one of those atoms in it. And so that's a good idea to kind of know, you know, that we're speaking the same language here. We've got two potassium atoms, one chromium, and four oxygens. Um, so let's go back to these types of bonds. Remember, there are three types of bonds. Ionic bonds, which are between metals and nonmetals. Covalent bonds, which are between nonmetals. And, and metallic bonds, which are between only metals. And so this is going to actually kind of give us a structure for how we name things, because you tend to follow a different set of rules depending on what kinds of bonds uh, make up a substance. So in ionic bonds, we've got binary compounds. Binary just means two parts. Um, if you are taking classes in anything having to do with computers, sometimes they might mention binary code. Uh, that's a, a language, computer language, is just made up of zeros and ones. And that's why it's called binary. It's only got two parts to it, zero and one. So binary compounds just means it has two uh, parts to it as well, two elements in it. So there are simple binary compounds for ionic substances, but then there are more advanced binary compounds. Um, Multivalent metals means metals that have multiple possible charges to them, and those really pop up in the transition metal area. So that's the second area we'll look into. And then the third area in ionic is going to be something called polyatomic ion compounds. Now, what is a polyatomic ion? There's going to be a whole video that's just on that. But the quick uh, explanation of it is it's a grouping of atoms that overall has a charge. That's what a polyatomic ion is. So that's going to round out ionic. In covalent, which again is between two nonmetals, we have binary compounds as well. That's just between two different elements. Um, but then we'll look at acids, how to name acids, and then also diatomic elements, which actually diatomic elements I can teach you right now. Remember the diatomic elements are the seven elements that can exist monatomically. They can exist on their own. Uh, Honkel, Fibber, Brinkelhoff, 7-Up. Well, those substances are just simply their element names. So for example, H2, you would just simply call that hydrogen. Um, O2, that would just become oxygen. So there we go, diatomic elements already checked off of our list. And then the last type of bond is a metallic bond. And there's really just metals that's uh, in that situation there. So uh, this one's easy too, I'll just tell you. 
if you've got a metallic bonded substance like a chunk of copper uh, or a piece of aluminum foil, well, the name for that substance is just simply going to be the element substance as well. So that chunk of copper would be called copper. <laughs> that sheet of aluminum foil would be called aluminum. And so that one's all set as well. So out of these seven kind of areas that we're going to look at in the naming and formula writing process, we've already got two of them done. So we just have these five left to do. Um, in the next video, we're really going to look at how to write ionic formulas. Uh, before we get into naming things, we have to make sure that we can uh, write correct formulas for ionic substances. And so that's going to be our first stop. And before we continue, I just want to talk about something that's going to pop up in this unit quite a bit, because if you see ionic and covalent are our remaining two kind of categories that we're going to discuss. And something that's common about both, both of those categories is that they contain nonmetals. Ionic substances have a nonmetal, covalent substances have all nonmetals. And so for uh, the nonmetal elements in the periodic table, which I've highlighted here, um, these elements' names change sometimes when they're in bonds. Um, and so we kind of have like a, we take the root or the base of the nonmetal element name, and then in many cases we add IDE as an ending. That's ID. Let me show you. So here are all the, the ones I highlighted from the periodic table. Hydrogen becomes hydride. Boron becomes boride. Carbon, carbide. Nitrogen, nitride. And so on. Now the bolded pieces of these words here are the nonmetal roots. And so sometimes that ID ending may change, um, but many times it just shows up just as it's written here. Now there are, of course, in chemistry, a bunch of examples. Chemistry is kind of famous for saying, here's a rule, and then turning right around and saying, and here's an exception to that rule, and here's an exception to that exception, and, and so on. So I'll kind of lead you through it as we go through this unit. But this right here, this screen is going to be helpful when you hear or read the word nonmetal eyed name, or that phrase, when you see that nonmetal eyed name. This is what that's referring to. And that's going to pop up in ionic bonding. It's also going to pop up in covalent bonding. So there's a, uh, a quick introduction to uh, the three types of bonds and how we're going to name them using this structure. Like I mentioned in our next video, we're going to focus on the ionic category. Um, but first, before we get into names, we're going to learn how to correctly write ionic formulas. So that's it. Thank you.